Now I want to spend a little time talking about actually interpreting NMR spectra. And we're going to start with the easier of two, and that's carbon-13 NMR. Uh, in this case, it's the easier of the two because you're, as an undergraduate, likely to only have to interpret what's called spin-decoupled carbon-13 NMR. Uh, there's going to be no splitting, no doublets, no triplets, things of this sort. Uh, and means there's just a lot less information to process, and that's what makes it easier. So there's two big things to know here. And the first you already know, and that's that the number of carbon environments in a molecule is equal to the number of signals in the spectrum. So the second thing is going to involve what we call the chemical shift. Now, in every NMR sample we run, we put in a reference compound, and that reference compound shows up with a signal. And wherever that signal shows up, we call that zero for the spectrum. And then every signal shows up so at some position in a shift relative to that reference compound. So your x-axis here is called the chemical shift, often symbolized with the Greek letter delta, so, and measured in parts per million. So in this case, what causes it to shift more towards the left or the right, and we'll find out those are referred to as upfield and downfield, is proximity to a couple of things, either pi electrons or electronegative atoms. We'll talk more about that later here, but uh, more towards the right-hand end, upfield, is when a nucleus is more shielded by the electrons around it. So whereas more towards the left end is downfield or deshielded when there's less electron density uh, around that nucleus, so fewer electrons around there. So in this case, uh, based on where it actually a signal actually shows up and the chemical shift, we can figure out is it an alkane, carbon? Is it an alkyne carbon? Is it an alkene carbon? Is it an aromatic carbon, a carbon in a benzene ring? Or is it a carbon double bonded to an oxygen, a carbonyl carbon? So that's the big deal here. So number of carbon environments equals the number of signals, and the chemical shift can tell us some details about what kind of environment that carbon atom is in. So now we're going to take a look at an actual carbon-13 NMR spectrum here, and this is for propionic acid. If you look at propionic acid, there are three carbons in propionic acid, and they are all in unique environments, and therefore there's going to be three signals in this spectrum. Now, you might look at me like, well, there's a little tiny signal right there. There's four signals, Chad, actually. Well, turns out that is your solvent. So, and a lot of spectrums, that might even be removed for you right from the get-go, especially if it's supplied on an exam or the textbook or something like that. But if you actually run your own spectra in the lab or something, you might see these solvent peaks. Uh, in this case, this is CDCL3, shows up right below 80. DMSO shows up right below 40. Um, they commonly show up in routine places, and we usually see a little triplet of peaks for them and stuff like that. So this big thing knows that this is not part of your compound, so we're going to ignore it here. So, But in this case, propionic acid, three carbons. They're all unique, so three signals. So... The two on the right here are in the alkane region of the spectrum, and we see that's from like 0 to 80-ish. So, and that's these two signals down here. And this carbon right here, that's closer to the oxygen. I'll label these carbons 1 and 2. It's not how you'd number them if you were to name it or anything like that. Uh, but in this case, that would be number 2, and that would be number 1. We'll find out in a little bit that the proximity to electronegative atoms like oxygen cause signals to show up more downfield, more towards the left on the spectrum. So finally, this carbon right here, the carbonyl carbon, showing up down here past 160, downfield of 160, as it should for a carbonyl carbon, in this case, part of a carboxylic acid. So in this case, three signals gives me three carbon environments for the molecule. So in this case, I can tell that there's two alkane environments and one carbonyl environment from the spectrum. So now let's take a look at proton NMR, or HNMR here is the case. Uh, and now we're going to be looking at spin-coupled spectra, and there's actually a lot more information to process here. But the first one won't be new here. That's going to be the chemical shift again. So, And that's pretty much analogous to what we saw in carbon-13 NMR. Find out that the x-axis here, again, is the chemical shift. It's in parts per million. And it's the chemical shift relative to some reference compound. And now I actually want to point out what that reference compound is. That's TMS here in the upper right-hand corner of your slide. So, and that's trimethyl, I'm sorry, tetramethylsilane here. So, silicon at the center, hence the name silane. Uh, in this case, it's got one hydrogen environment and one carbon environment. So, and also being silicon is not very electronegative. So, you are not likely to have any signals typically showing up right of the signal. So, it's a good zero point for our spectrum. So, there's our typical reference compound, just a little piece of trivia to file away for a great multiple choice question. Uh, but again, the chemical shift here is going to you know, let us know if we're in an alkane, an alkene, an aromatic, an aldehyde, or a carboxylic acid. And technically, alkynes down here at somewhere around two and a half. It's just not common, so I'm kind of leaving it off my, my table here. Uh, you'll also see uh, 
that we've got one special subset of the alkane region, and that's a hydrogen bonded to a carbon that's next to an electronegative atom. And in such case, that's the only way you kind of get downfield of three in this alkane region. So a couple things to note. The boundaries on these regions are soft. You put a bunch of electronegative atoms nearby or something like this, and you might get something totally uh, abnormal shifting outside of the normal typical ranges here. Um, but again, most of the time, this is typically the ranges you're going to see things. So let's talk a little more about what affects the chemical shift of a proton and proton NMR here. And it's really two big things, and the most important one is usually the less emphasized one, so I'm going to emphasize it first. But that's your proximity to pi electrons. So if you notice, alkenes have pi electrons, benzene rings have pi electrons. So in your aldehyde, the carbonyl's got pi electrons, and same thing in the carboxylic acid. And so all these hydrogens that are associated with pi electrons are further downfield and deshielded. So these terms shielded and deshielded, first off, are just referring to the electrons. So electrons have a negative charge, and moving charges can generate their own magnetic fields, and in this case, in opposition to the external magnetic field you're probing the molecules with. So in this case, that's what we mean by shielded. A nucleus is shielded when it has a higher electron density around it. So deshielded, then, would be a lower electron density around it. And it turns out, when you put pi electrons in a magnetic field, their motion results in deshielding. Uh, the second thing, though, so and this is the one that usually gets more emphasis, it's a little easier to understand, is that proximity to an electronegative atom. So in this case, that's going to pull electron density away from a nucleus, making it less shielded or deshielded, and therefore show up more downfield, more to the left end of the spectrum here. And so typically, like if you've got an alkane here, that's like from zero uh, to upwards of four and a half, maybe even five. Uh, in this case, though, there's a special subset, and I've kind of showed that here. This subset is if you are a hydrogen attached to a carbon that's also attached to an electronegative atom like nitrogen, oxygen, or a halogen. Uh, that's the only way you're typically going to show up f downfield of three if you're still an alkane type hydrogen. Uh, so notice this is a, a less prominent effect than the proximity of pi electrons because you don't have to be near anything elect electronegative, but if you're simply an alkene hydrogen, you're going to show up you know, downfield of where most alkanes show up whether they're near an electronegative atom or not. So again, the proximity of pi electrons is the most important thing, but second of second importance here is this proximity to electronegative atoms. Now we looked earlier at the carbon-13 NMR spectrum for propionic acid. Now I want to look at the HNMR spectrum here, and we can see that we've got three signals in the HNMR spectrum, and in this case, these three hydrogens are all equivalent due to free rotation. These two are also equivalent. Turns out they're enantiotopic, but they're chemically equivalent. And then we've got this guy here. So, and in three environments, we should expect three signals. Same thing we saw with carbon-13 NMR. The number of environments equals the number of signals. So in this case, though, we don't have simple singlets. We'll talk about the splitting patterns and stuff later, but I first just want to focus on the chemical shift here. So here, this signal's showing up on the far right upfield, a little over one. We have another one showing up between two and three, around two and a half, and another one showing up way down around 12. Now, the one showing up down around 12 here, we can see that's your carboxylic acid OH. That's responsible for that signal there. The other two in the alkane, alkane region, though, and so we can see that alkane region is from like zero to four and a half. So, and in this case, these are attached to carbons, neither of which is attached to an electronegative atom. So they're not going to make it down field of three here. So they're both up field of three. And in this case, these two are closer to the oxygen. So are both oxygens, and therefore further down field, and these three here. So here, again, three signals, three environments, two in the alkane, one the carboxylic acid hydrogen. So similar to the kind of information we process from the carbon-13 NMR. But this is just the first piece of info. Let's take a look at the two other pieces of information we're going to gather from the HNMR spectra.